Good evening. My name is Dr. Joan Reed, and I am Dean for Diversity and Community Partnership at Harvard Medical School and Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. On behalf of the three sponsors for this evening, Dr. Vincenzo Turan, Director of the Office of Diversity and Inclusion at the Harvard School of Dental Medicine, Dr. Lilu Barbosa, Chief Diversity, Inclusion and Belonging Officer in the Office of Diversity and Inclusion at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health in my office, the Harvard Medical School Office for Diversity, Inclusion and Community Partnership, as well as the planning group. I want to thank all of you for joining us this evening. Our program, the 2021 Voting, Health Policy and Social Justice, Political Determinants of Health includes registrants that are health professionals, faculty, students, trainees, attorneys, administrators, members of our community uh, from across multiple organizations and 27 states. A little bit more about this evening's event. It's part of a component of a set of Harvard University programs centered around voting. In addition to this webinar, our planning group has also prepared information on voting resources that can be found on our HMS DICP website, um, HTTPS DICP.HMS.Med.Harvard.EU, and it will say voting resources. Our focus this evening incorporates concepts of both the social and political determinants of health. Professor Daniel Dawes, who's director of the Satcher Health Leadership Institute, will be the keynote speaker. And Dr. David Williams, the Florence Bragg Norman and Laura Smart Norman Professor of Public Health at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health will moderate a panel and then um, guide us through a question and answer session. The panel discussion will link to areas around oral health, public health, medicine and health disparities. Um, none of our program presenters have reported any conflicts of interest. And there are just a few housekeeping notes before we get, begin. Chat will not be available during the session. All mics will be muted for participants. Um, we ask that you use the Q&A to post any questions to the speaker or the panelists. Um, and this session is being recorded uh, and will later be posted on our DICP website. Uh, the session is also closed captioned. And now turning to our keynote speaker for tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor, Professor Daniel Dawes, who's a widely respected author, scholar, educator, and leader in the health equity, health reform, and mental health movements. He's executive director of the Satcher Health Leadership Institute at Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta, and a professor of health law, policy, and management. He's also the co-founder of the Health Equity Leadership and Exchange Network, Helen, which is a nationwide network of over 2000 governmental and non-governmental leaders and scholars focused on bolstering leadership and the exchange of research, information, and solutions to advance evidence-based health equity focused policies and programs. Professor Dawes' research focuses on the drivers of health inequities among under-resourced, vulnerable, and marginalized communities, and its pioneer of a new approach to examining in in inequities, the political determinants of health. He's authored two groundbreaking books, 150 Years of Obamacare and the Political Determinants of Health, published both by Johns Hopkins University Press. Um, I ask you um, that you save your questions following Dr. Um, Professor Dawes' presentation, and they will be addressed in the question and answer led by Dr. Williams at the end. And with that, I turn this over to Professor Daniel Dawes. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Reed, for that very generous introduction. Let me tell you what an honor it is to be introduced by the great Joan Reed. I thank you, Professor. And I thank you all so much for the opportunity to, to join this distinguished panel of trailblazers in this health equity movement. I, I wanna particularly uh, thank uh, Dr. Ruben Warren and Dr. David Williams, who have uh, been incredible mentors to me as well as with Dr. Reed and um, have really led the efforts to widen our understanding about these pesky determinants of health. So today I wanna talk about how we can move beyond merely nibbling around the problem of health inequities in America and how we can really move forward further upstream than we've ever been able to at this point 
and tackle those upstream factors, that instigator of all of these multiple interacting determinants of our health and of our lives. So without further ado, let's begin. So this is Lady Columbia or Lady Justice, whoever you want her to be, right? And in her hands are this scale of justice, right? You see many folks falling through the cracks. Well, for too long in this country, many racial and ethnic minorities and other vulnerable and marginalized groups have found themselves in a precarious situation. Their health, their lives, literally hanging in the balance. Many of them falling through the cracks of our health system, our educational system, human services, housing, behavioral health, employment systems. They struggle to live in a society that has intentionally erected barrier after barrier to weaken their bodies and hasten their deaths. For over 400 years, these groups have experienced inequities throughout the life course, from womb to tomb. The inequities in health status, as we know, and in healthcare are widely documented. Over 7,000 peer reviewed journal articles, right? Showing these inequities. Well, I wanna start with a story that highlights what I think is an incredible case for why we must continue to push for health equity in America and why with the privilege and the power that each of us have, that we must use it to advance the cause. It started with a headache in late March. Then came the body aches. At first, Shalandra Rollins' doctor thought that it was the flu. By April 7, three days after she was finally diagnosed with COVID-19, the 38-year-old teaching assistant who had two years earlier managed to beat the odds, having lacked health insurance at, time, at times in her adulthood, working in low-paying jobs, experiencing limited access to care, working hard to get her associate's degree, told her mom that she was feeling winded Within an hour, she was placed in an ambulance, conscious, but struggling to breathe, bound for a hospital. An hour later, she was pronounced dead. You see, Shalandra Rollins, a mother of two, had a number of factors that put her at high risk of dying from COVID-19. Like her mother, she had diabetes. She was black with a low salary job and very few resources. To date, we've lost over 38,000 Black lives, 220,000 collectively, to COVID-19. And the majority of these individuals had an underlying health condition. We know that the underlying health factors such as asthma and heart disease, obesity, and so forth, they strike disproportionately within communities of color and lower socioeconomic status communities. And as a result, these communities experience a greater risk or are dying at greater um, amounts from COVID-19. The inequities that predate COVID, however, didn't suddenly appear, nor are they inapplicable. Minorities, people with disabilities, and other vulnerable communities still contend with neighborhoods that are largely devoid of necessary health protective and health sustaining resources. And they still contend with the political determinants or drivers that created, perpetuated, and exacerbated these health inequities throughout our nation's history. We know that racial and ethnic minorities and other vulnerable groups die disproportionately each year, and it is costing us significantly in many ways. But the one thing that we must always remember is that in the United States, the nation's health is not an organic outcome. It is not a coincidence that certain groups of Americans experience higher premature death rates or poor health outcomes than others. Why? Why is this happening? Today, we recognize that a variety of forces collectively impact our health and determine the quality and the extent of our life on this earth, including the social, environmental, economic, behavioral health, healthcare, genetic factors, right? As Dr. David Williams has opened our minds to. It is true that air pollution, climate change, toxic waste sites, unclean water, lack of fresh fruits and vegetables, unsafe, unsecure, and unstable housing, among many other factors, right? play an outsized role in our overall health and well-being. They increase our stress, they expose us to harmful elements, and they limit our opportunities to thrive. These social determinants of health, yes, play an outsized role in these human-made pre-existing inequities. But underlying each one 
is a political determinant that we can no longer ignore. Too often, you know, we've been stopping at the social drivers of inequities, failing to dig even further to see the depths of the problem and understand its root causes and distribution. And as a result, we're missing the link between the social determinants of health and their political roots. So let me illustrate this with a very short story, right? If you were to envision all of society sitting on the banks of a mighty river, fishing and finding nourishment in the resources that the river provides, the health inequities that we face are represented by the differences in the caliber and quantity of fish we encounter. Some people have a bounty of healthy fish, right? And vegetation to feed off of while others only have small fish, no fish, no vegetation, or even malnourished fish. Different people having access to different types of resources and different parts of the river represents the social determinants of health. Some people are located in a slower moving part of the river by no fault of their own. Others are located in a more lush part of the river and benefit because of such by specific decisions made on their behalf. These are the political determinants of health. You see, somewhere upstream, decisions were made to divert the river to benefit certain groups of people and harm others. And decisions were made to place certain types of people on specific banks of the river while placing others elsewhere. As we know, these upstream decisions have downstream impacts. And what's interesting is that this pandemic demonstrates the inconvenient and harsh truth about the social determinants of health and how collectively these factors significantly contribute to our society's health inequities. It shows the compounding effect of political determinants over personal responsibility. Because you see, no matter how much many African Americans, Native Americans, Native Hawaiians, Latinx Americans, Pacific Islander Americans, and others try to act responsibly, there are always structural, institutional, interpersonal, even interpersonal obstacles hindering them. Beneath these communities' notice are political determinants that have pulled and continue to pull strings that prevent them from achieving their optimal health and full potential. And so is it any wonder why COVID-19 hasn't been striking all population groups equally? No, because our economic and social policies have not been benefiting all equally. Think about who's been able to get tested, who's getting care, access to care, the quality of care, even access to water, access to food, all are political determinants of health. So how did we get here, right? How did we get here? We know that inequality gets under our skin and it leads to accelerated aging. And thanks to the great work of epigen epigeneticists, we know that there's inter intergenerational trauma that has occurred, right? from one generation to the next over a period of 400 plus years. So we know that the social determinants of health really create the structural conditions in which we are born and we live and we're employed, we worship, et cetera. But have we stopped to ask ourselves, how did those structural conditions appear in the first place? How did they come to be in the first place? Well, let's go back over 400 years. You all are in Massachusetts, right? We know that Massachusetts was the first colony to legalize slavery. We know other colonies followed suit. And if that wasn't enough for policymakers, right, to keep these enslaved individuals down, African slaves down, no, they went even further and started developing and implementing and enforcing other policies that denied or prohibited Blacks and indigenous populations from raising their own food, from pro prohibiting them from earning their own money, from learning to read and write, especially English, from socializing with one another, right? We know that there were restrictions. You couldn't go even beyond a one mile radius to socialize with your friends and others, right? We know that you had to have a pass in order to do so, carry a lantern at night if you wanted. We know that these laws, these policies were recycled from one century to the next, from one generation to the next. We know there was a period of time in which health equity leaders then tried to address those political determinants of health inequities, right? Leveraging the power of the federal government under Abraham Lincoln to do so. However, what we realized then was that that was short-lived and Jim Crow reared its ugly head. We know that policymakers at all levels then instituted policies again that disinvested in these resources, that denied them, that starved these population groups 
of the resources that they needed to thrive. We know then there was an effort to move beyond facially uh, discriminatory policies, right? That were explicitly discriminatory against blacks and indigenous and other per, uh, people of color. Well, they moved to facially neutral policies, right? But it had the same effect. They had a disparate impact. Even though they weren't discriminatory on their face, they had a dis disparate impact. And so think about it this way, right? If you, are to, if you were to go into many black neighborhoods in this country, uh, let's say from Miami to Atlanta, Baltimore to New York, even to uh, Newton in Boston, right? What do you oftentimes see in these neighborhoods? You'll see a major highway cutting right through the um, African-American neighborhoods. You'll see parking lots where houses and apartments once stood. You see bus depots that were placed in these neighborhoods. Again, if you even look at Manhattan, six of the seven bus depots in that city were located in Harlem, the black community, right? And is it any wonder that these communities have the highest rates of asthma? No, they've been breathing in the most polluted ear. But again, all of these infrastructure, these social determinants were created by an act of law, by policy, from the Housing Act to the Highway Act and beyond, right? We know the impact it's had over these communities. In your state of Massachusetts, we know that uh, then there was an effort, right, to redline these communities by the Homeowners Loan Corporation Act, by the Franklin D. Roosevelt administration. We know then again that the result was to starve these, re these communities of the resources from getting FHA loans and VA loans and the commercial interests then followed suit, right? We know that banks, hospitals, grocery chains and others said to themselves, well, if the federal government, if these governments aren't investing in these communities, why would we ever do that? That's a poor return on our investment. And as a result today, what do we see? We see the effects of years and years of these political determinants, right? In the way of a poverty tax on these communities, in the form of higher payments for auto insurance, for mortgage loans, lower property appraisals and the like. We see the effects in terms of, farm, of, of food, pharmacy, hospital deserts, right? And food swamps in these communities, making it more difficult to access resources to improve health and maintain health. And now we've moved away from redlining in these communities to blue lining as a result of climate change, right? Climate gentrification is happening and it's displacing minorities across the country. So we've looked at how policies uh, have been used to actually entrench the inequities in our society. But as I mentioned, there were a few instances, right? of health equity leaders fighting from the very beginning in 1789 of our country's existence as a constitutional form of government. There were leaders fighting to get the federal government to address these issues. They really pushed in the beginning to uh, get the new Congress, get George Washington, President Washington, to do something, to stop the separation of children from their families, right? The breakup of these families. They wanted to provide healthcare access to these individuals, to to address their needs in terms of food and clothing, the ability to be educated and employed, right? Truly. Well, those efforts were knocked down and uh, you had a very bitter a very contentious debate in 1789, 1790. There was a pushback on that effort. And it was the first time that the light of health equity had dimmed in the United States relative to policy. Well, it would take 75 years before the political stars aligned again and Abraham Lincoln, through his supporters, got together and, and tried to push for our nation's first federal policy addressing the social determinants of health, right? Among freed, newly freed people and poor whites who were displaced as a result of the Civil War. That's the Freedmen's Bureau Act. But as we all know, racism does not sleep in this country. And what we saw happen was a concerted effort year after year to undermine that law and eventually on the seventh anniversary, they succeeded. For the sake of time, I can't go in, but to say that it's been quite a challenging period, it would take us another 150 years in this country before we were able to realize a similar piece of legislation through the Affordable Care Act. Let me just close by bringing up, we've been distracted lately by the executive and legislative branches of our government, but I do wanna highlight for you, you know, the quiet branch of our federal government and what they've been doing in civil rights laws to um, really undermine years and years of attempts to bolster health equity in this country, civil rights and the like. You know, before in the 1800s, the court, the Supreme Court had denied the existence of inequities and linking them to a political determinant. 
Well, recently you had the court now admitting, well, yes, there are vestiges of past segregation by state decree, and they do remain in our society. Past wrongs committed by the state and in its name are a stubborn fact of history. And stubborn facts of history linger and persist. But though we cannot escape our history, neither must we overstate its consequences in fixing legal responsibilities. Can you imagine that? This is alarming for several reasons, at least three. As our great leaders here on this um, panel know, the court fails to take into account the evidence from a broad spectrum of research, right? Demonstrating the lasting impact that these vestiges of slavery, segregation, and subsequent discrimination have on population groups. Second, the court statement has a rippling effect into other case law at all levels, right, of the judicial branch, setting a precedent for other policies commissioned by other governmental bodies. And then third, they are arbitrarily determining the point at which these vestiges of legally sanctioned discrimination cease to significantly impact certain communities, right? Essentially arguing that after a certain amount of time, it doesn't matter anymore, get over it. Well, we know better than that, right? The court would rather view inequities as products of private choices or products of the social determinants so they don't have constitutional implications or legally enforceable remedies. So for all of us who are health equity advocates, to, if we continue to make the case that inequities are solely socially derived and fail to show the political connection, we're only gonna bolster the US Supreme Court's viewpoint on this issue, thus weakening legal protections to check these structural and institutional forms of discrimination, as well as denying legal remedies to those impacted by inequities. So how can we leverage the political determinants of health in the last minute that I have? Uh, let me just mention that we are in a very serious situation. Yes, we are in this triple or even quadruple pandemic, right? And we understand that never before in this country during a pandemic have we ever been able to realize an equitable policy response. We have in other crises, as you heard me mention with the civil war, in wars, in natural disasters, recessions and depressions, but never before during a recession. And my hope is that, you know, as we're moving forward, we'll understand those levers that we can push and pull. Now, I don't have time to get into this wonky model, but to say that we certainly need to address the structures, the processes and the outputs that have created these inequities over time. And let me just uh, leave you with this thought by my dear friend and mentor, uh, Dr. David Satcher, who was our 16th U.S. Surgeon General, the founder of the Satcher of Leadership Institute at Morehouse School of Medicine. And, and what he has said, you know, and he's told me this time and time again, but I think it's even more important that we think about this, right? Health injustices, health inequities will persist like they have for generations in this country, unless we seriously tackle the root causes or upstream factors. And so in order to do that, we need leaders who care enough they know enough, they've studied these drivers of inequities, they have the courage to do enough and who will persevere until the job is done. And I hope we have such folks today on this webinar. Thank you again, thank you, Dr. Reed, for the extra time, I really appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Professor Dawes. Thank you for setting the stage and helping us to fully understand the importance of history and the importance of context. Yes. Important ways in which it informs where we are today. You'll have an opportunity to have questions and uh, for Professor Dawes at the end of the panel, but I want to now turn to our moderator for this next session, uh, Dr. David Williams, who is the Florence and Lauren Norman Professor of Public Health and Chair of the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. He's also a professor of African and African-American studies at Harvard University. Dr. Williams is an internationally recognized authority on social influences on health and the author of more than 475 scientific papers. His research has enhanced our understanding of the ways in which race, socioeconomic status, stress, racism, health behavior, and religious involvement can affect health. He's clearly a national leader and has a role in raising our awareness at multiple levels around the inequalities and inequities in health, but also about the interventions to in address those inequities. And with that, I turn this over to Dr. Williams. 
Thank you so very much, Dean Reed, for your kind words of introduction. And it's truly a privilege to be here and to, to listen to really the insightful uh, presentation tonight uh, by my great colleague, um, Dr. Daniel Dawes. Um, I want to introduce uh, a wonderful panel that we have that will give us reflections on, on, on what we have heard. And then I, I will moderate a, a question and answer session where we are looking uh, for active engagement uh, from everyone online. Remember, uh, put your, your question and, uh, that you would like to, to be answered in the Q&A uh, um, box. Do not use the, the chat box, but use the Q&A box uh, for your questions. But first, let me uh, introduce the three uh, distinguished panelists that we have uh, tonight. Uh, first, uh, Anna King, uh, a doctoral candidate um, from the Fielding School of Public Health at, at UCLA. We are totally thrilled uh, to have you uh, with us this evening. Our second panelist um, is Dr. Jose Figueroa, um, he is an assistant professor um, both at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and at the Harvard Medical School, and we are thrilled to have you join uh, the panel tonight. And last, but in no way least, uh, my great colleague of, of many, of, of, of some decades, I would say, uh, Dr. Ruben Warren, who has been a champion uh, in the field of, of public health with many leadership positions over the years. And currently, he's the director of the National Center for Bioethics um, and professor of bioethics at Tuskegee University. We are thrilled to have these distinguished panelists and they will each uh, uh, present in the order in which I have introduced them. And then please put, send your question and answers in. Thank you so much. Dr. Reed for inviting me here to talk about voting health and social justice and to that wonderful introduction from Dr. Williams um, and also to Dr. Dawes for his presentation on the political determinants. I want to highlight the intersection between voter suppression, political determinants and health. Um, I will share a few points first about how voter suppression is connected to racism, second, how it impacts health, and third, about the unique confluence of voting, racism, and health in the present context of the COVID-19 pandemic. So first, when I think of voter suppression, I don't see it as just a method to grab more power by one political party or another. Um, rather, we need to center voter suppression within its historic context, as Dr. Dawes demonstrated, and we need to truly understand voter suppression as a form of structural racism that is meant to uphold white supremacy. We should be outraged that the right to vote is being strategically taken away and that this theft is likely contributing to in seemingly intractable social, economic, and health disparities for racial minorities. Um, so first, we know that voter suppression has a disparate impact on voters of color. Voters of color wait twice as long to vote as white voters, with 22 minutes of wait time compared to 11 minutes for white voters. Um, when early voting opened in Georgia this past week, people were waiting in line for 10 hours, and a majority of these people were in communities of color. Um, when voting by mail, voters of color are, less, are twice as likely to have their ballots rejected as white voters. And um, when we consider the requirements of identification to vote, we see black voters being directly impacted. Driver's licenses are often required and African-Americans have driver's license at half the rate of whites. So in 2008, only 26 states required no documentation to vote and now only 17 do not. Um, additionally, in 2016, as compared to 2012, we saw 868 fewer polling places for people to vote at. Most of these closures were in non-white neighborhoods and were enacted as a result of the Shelby County v. Holder Supreme Court decision in 2013, which invalidated part of the Voting Rights Act, which er, protected against discrimination. So second, let us consider how voting is connected to health. Um, voting has been found to be beneficial for health. Young adults who vote have higher future income, more education, better mental health, and engage in more health-promoting behaviors. So conversely, it's very possible that being unable to vote will be bad for your health. There are many ways in which voter suppression could influence your health. We can think about how voter suppression is connected to the creation of policies and laws from the local to national levels. These policies determine how resources, capital, and opportunity are distributed throughout our society. Because of the stratification, some people have more resources to use as a buffer against stressors while others have fewer. Those with fewer resources may end up living in environments filled with more exposure to risk with negative consequences for their health. 
um, preliminary results for my dissertation research suggest that having higher inequality in voting, which is the goal between voter, of voter suppression, that Blacks vote less than whites, um, is associated with higher levels of segregation and higher levels of income inequality, and that the highest levels of voting inequality are associated with lower levels of air pollution. Further, voting inequality has a protective effect on life expectancy for whites, but not for Blacks. And this relationship is mediated by segregation. So it's likely that voter suppression does shape health through pathways um, and the various policies that create these conditions in which people live. In turn, those conditions shape their health. Voter suppression may also influence health through discrimination and stigma. Those who are not allowed to vote may feel stigma in being a second class citizen. If you're asked to show your ID at the polls, you're turned away, you experience intimidation or other suppressive acts, you might interpret this as a form of discrimination against yourself or members of your racial group. We know that discrimination has consequences for health as it operates through stress processes, as Dr. Williams has extensively shown, to transform psychosocial stressors into physiological outcomes. Um, health may also be impacted through psychosocial processes. Being excluded from the vote could cause feelings of loss of control or disempowerment, and that can negatively impact your health too. Um, and further, voter suppression may have direct consequences for your health. If you have to wait in long lines in extreme conditions or vote during a pandemic, and mail-in voting or early voting are denied to you, then you'll have to vote in person and expose yourself to increased risk to the virus, um, detrimental conditions, or other factors that influence your health. Um, and lastly, a feedback loop exists through which voters, between voter suppression and health. And those with worse health are actually less likely to vote. So if voter suppression causes poor health or even death, the process of disenfranchisement is further reinforced. So lastly, I'd like to think about voter suppression and health in the context of the pandemic. People of color are suffering the worst effects of both, as Dr. Dow so clearly explained in relation to COVID. With the pandemic and the primary elections in March and April, we saw that one way that officials tried to cut down the risk of transmission was by limiting the number of polling places. But this also cut down, or this also acted as a form of voter suppression because there were less places for people to vote. Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where Blacks make up 38% of the population, yet constitute half of coronavirus cases and over 80% of the COVID-related deaths, saw the number of polling places dwindle from 180 to five for a city of nearly 600,000. As Milwaukee's health commissioner said, they did this to enforce voter suppression. They did it because they wanted to force Black people, poor people to risk their lives. So in the upcoming election, we're seeing this intersection between health policy and electoral policy. How we hold our elections and the safety precautions in place are absolutely a concern for public health and health practitioners. Just having poor health can make people less likely to vote, but fear of getting sick may also prevent people from showing up. Um, so voter suppression in this election likely shape the policies enacted to address the long-term consequences of the pandemic as well. Um, extension to the CARES Act, healthcare coverage, eviction forgiveness, and other housing policies and economic support will be impacted by who is in power with direct consequences for health equity. Um, so I wanna reiterate that voting is a right, it is not a privilege. And moving forward, we need to name voter suppression as structural racism. We need to consider it in its historic context and fight it at all levels from the federal to the local. Um, and we need more research and data to explore this link between voter suppression and health to move closer to health equity. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, next, Dr. Jose Figueroa. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I am one honor to be on this panel and I, I am looking forward to, to the rest of it. And I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to everyone. Uh, so I spend much of my time examining the impact of health policies on quality and cost of care for the American people. And when it comes to understanding the state of health and well being for vulnerable populations, including low income people of color, I really do think we have to start by taking a close look at the current state of our health policies. For the past decade, one of the key strategies of US healthcare policy and delivery reform has focused on shifting our healthcare system to be one of a value based care system. So since the passage of the ACA, the federal government has implemented over 40 different value-based care programs or pay for performance programs. And the objective of these programs is pretty simple. It's to improve quality and reduce cost of care, which most of us would argue is a good thing. However, the federal government, CMS, 
And we as the people in this country have a major problem. Nearly every single value-based care program that has come out has in its core DNA some form of structural racism and discrimination. Time and time again, almost every evaluation and publication that comes out and asks a question, do these programs work? If so, how? One outcome is always the same. Value-based care programs disproportionately penalize healthcare providers that take care of more disadvantaged people, including doctors and hospitals that take care of some more that take care of more people of color, more low, low income individuals, more people from disadvantaged neighborhoods. And these are providers, these safety net providers that are often uh, financially constrained with limited resources. And on the other side, these programs often reward and bonus providers that take care of the wealthiest most uh, and, and, and white populations mostly. And sometimes these programs are actually a, a zero sum game. So the money that is taken away from the safety net providers is actually then given to the other uh, non safety net providers. It is what some of my colleagues uh, and I are calling the health policy regressive tax. You may ask, so why are these safety net providers bearing the brunt of most of these penalties from these programs? Well, it is because most of these programs do not account what we are talking about today, things we know matter, the social determinants of health. Most of these programs only account for differences in clinical risk of patient populations that the providers serve, and they actually don't take into account someone's level of education, income level, whether they have housing or food insecurity, or any other social risk factor that we know matters when it comes to influencing health and well-being. So we have a problem, structural discrimination in US health policy. To break it, I think we need to reevaluate re every major program we have currently in place with an equity lens. It is not enough to ask, will this program improve quality of care on average for the average person? We also need to ask, how is this policy going to affect the most vulnerable among us, including low-income people, including people of color, and do these programs actually meaningfully improve the care of people? If we don't, we will continue, unfortunately, to have an unfair burden on, uh, place an unfair burden on healthcare providers and communities that take care of our most vulnerable people. So thank you for the invitation again, and I look forward to the rest of the panel. Thank you so much. And our final panelist, uh, Dr. Ruben Warren. I've uh, been inspired by listening to my colleagues and of course, always I'm encouraged by the work of Dr. Williams. Um, Dr. Dawes set the stage, so all we really need to do is reflect on what he said and that's what I intend to do over the next few minutes. I'm very pleased to participate in anything that uh, Joan Reed does because I always know that what she's doing is a part of a greater vision for social justice. And for me, public health and social justice are synonymous. The tools, the armamentarium, if you will, may be epidemiology, biostatistics, health policy and management, social and behavioral sciences. It may be nutrition or population health, but social justice is the vision. We use terms like health risk, uh, health risk factors, health risk markers of health disparities, health inequities. We describe to describe the various nuances that impact upon health, but they really are different pieces of the same puzzle. In fact, the Secretary's Task Force Report on Black and Minority Health in, in 90, 1985 published um, in, um, breathtaking phenomenal document that talked about the health disparities. They didn't call it that then, but they talked about excess deaths, which are really preventable, unnecessary deaths experienced by the African-American population if you use the uh, non-Hispanic white population as a baseline. Well, I'm a dentist and I always uh, I'm have to remind people that oral health and systemic health comprise components of overall health. You can't do one without the other, particularly when you talk about the quality of life uh, considerations. Thanks to Dr. Reed, for always including oral health in her work. 
I spent most of my career engaged in public health policy at the local, state, national, and international level, and seldom do they include oral health in the conversation. They often use or talk about dentists when you're talking about health policy related to dental care, but in fact, oral health is much broader than dental care. But there's some good news. Uh, on September 24, 2020, the FDA issued an update recommendation concerning dental amalgam and the potential risk to certain high risk individuals that may be associated with mercury containing fillings used to restore the missing structures and surfaces of decayed teeth. Disproportionately low income black and brown children have dental caries, therefore disproportionately are receiving amalgam fillings. Most oral health policy evolves around three basic constructs, availability, accessibility, and acceptability of care. Does it exist? Can I get to it? And do I find it acceptable? Dr. Doss' political determinants of health really frames social determinants of health as a outcome, as an outcome. The real issue, in my view, is what are the systems that determine social determinants of health? that continue to disadvantage certain groups and, and advantage others. For most of my life, I've been working in various spheres of ethics and didn't even know it. Over the last decade, my charge at Tuskegee University has been to unpack the various spheres of e ethics and develop ethics research in um, health policy, health ethics research in community engagement and ethics research across the board. This forum, is a perfect example of how we use ethics to impact on the health of vulnerable populations. My take home message to you, please hear me clearly, go vote, please go vote. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Warren, and, and thank you to all of the panelists. Really, what an what a insightful evening and, and so many great ideas, and we have uh, lots of great questions. Um, my first question is, is for Professor Dawes. Um, the question is, the, the idea of corporate personhood, can you comment on the idea of corporate personhood and how it contributes to disparities? and to our ability to even think about the social and political determinants? Oh, I, I love that question because one of the things that I've noticed is that in this country, you saw me talk about the dearth of policies that took an equity lens to them, right? That were intended to uh, advance health equity. And what we've, what we've come to see is that every single one of the policies, few in number, although few in number, they always had to align with a commercial interest and a government investment value. That has been something that I found very interesting. You can talk about, and you can make a moral argument till your tongue bleeds at the federal level, but that will never resonate with this government, right? If you, however, tie that agenda, that health equity agenda, right? And try to advance a policy that actually ties to an economic or national security argument, that is what has usually worked. So case in point, um, if, you, if you go back to 1946, uh, after World War II, there was an attempt after about 150 years by mental health reformers trying to push for their mental health equity bill. They finally thought about, well, gee, we're coming out of a world, a major world war, and there are so many people with mental health challenges, right? Uh, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and the like. Well, they had always been making the moral argument for, we just got to do right by these people. We got to stop the stigma. We got to give them opportunities to thrive. Well, after, after World War II, what they recognized was the, there were 20% of young people at that time who were unfit for military service. This became a major issue for employers, for the government. Uh, then 40% of young people were leaving the military, right? Again, owing to these uh, health issues. So what did they say? They said, let's get together, let's figure this out. And they made arguments to President Truman. They aligned themselves with the admirals and the generals and the corporate interest at that time. And then they succeeded finally in passing the first mental health legislation, although piecemeal, um, to advance uh, mental health equity. So in, in terms of answering that question, you always in this country, in order at that federal level, you've always had to tie it 
to a commercial interest to one of those arguments, whether economic or national security, to get it through to the finish line. Thank you so much. My next question, and I can ask each of the panelists to weigh in quickly on this. Um, and this is someone trying to understand what do I do tonight moving forward? What are two things that everyone watching should do? Given our discussion of the political determinants of health uh, and the role of voting, what are two things that everyone watching tonight should do? Um, open it to it, 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 all of the panelists who would like to, to respond quickly. What are two things you would recommend for everyone to do? This is Ruben Warren. I would first say review this panel discussion, review it in detail. And the second thing and most important thing is go vote. Okay, thank you, Dr. Warren. A anyone else would like to, to respond? What, what do you suggest practically people can do moving forward? This is Jose. I, I think one thing that, and which is the one thing I'm doing every day is to find someone who did not vote the last election, who can vote to vote and, and to help them get a plan. There are a lot of people, I think, that uh, just never get to the voting polls. And, and that is, I think, one thing that we can all do. Thank you. Um, in addition to voting, I think considering people who don't have access to the vote, um, who either aren't citizens or um, may be disenfranchised and voting for their interests as well as your own. And then um, also considering voting as kind of the the bare minimum of civic engagement and considering how, um, as we've identified problems within the system, what other things you can do um, either through community organizing or on the grassroots level in order to make sure that um, everyone has equal power. Thank you, Anna. There was a question specifically directed to you, Anna, and that is, uh, can people uh, vote who do not have a physical address? And uh, what, 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 uh, what options do homeless people have in terms of voting? Thank you. Um, that's a really good question. So if you are unhoused, um, you are able to report the location that you live, whether it's a cross street or some general description of your location, um, but you do have to have a mailing address as well. And so for some people that can be really difficult because you have to have a PO box um, and you also do have to have some form of ID or the last four digits of your social security number, I believe. And this is all specific to California, um, but there are there are ways that you can vote, but there are certainly other barriers, um, even if you are registered to getting to the polls and having all the, the information that you need to get this done. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Dawes, another uh, question for you. Uh, most civil rights uh, legislation is limited by the requirement that they have to uh, prove intent to discriminate? How, how big a barrier is that? And are there things that we could do from a political determinants of health to address that? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I saw the um, comment about Dana Bowen Matthew, who you know I'm a great friend of, and um, I completely agree with her scholarship in this area. It is, is, it is one of the reasons why, you know, when we were working on the Affordable Care Act, we recognized that no health law had ever included a private right of action. So what does that mean? It means that we're giving you the ability if you've been discriminated because of your sex, race, um, you know, whether your gender identity or sexual orientation and so forth, we're giving you the right to go in a court of law and sue to enforce that right. Because oftentimes it is so hard to meet that threshold of intent, right? When it comes to discrimination. We talked about how we've moved away from uh, facially discriminatory policies to facially neutral policies, but they're having a disparate impact. And we know that the courts have eroded uh, some of those um, um, case law over time. So, so the idea was in section 1557 of the law, we wanted to place a private right of action that would allow individuals who've been discriminated, people of color in particular, the ability to go in and say, well, the threshold should be such that I can go and at least enforce my right. I'm not at the mercy of a state government or other entity to go and enforce that right for me. So that's a, something to think about. All right, let me uh, throw an, another question out. I, I think Professor Dawes, um, you may respond to that, but others may, may want to weigh in. Uh, we are in a unique moment um, in, in American history. Uh, we are in a presidential election where the incumbent is vowing not to abide by the results unless he wins. Uh, what uh, would you recommend as plan B uh, for achieving policy change if, if it's predicated on elections determining power to make policy. So 
So how, how do we deal with this unique moment we're in and what are our options? I see a smile on Professor Dawes's face. <laughs> I know this is not. <laughs> <laughs> you, you see the smile because you 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 stumped me, Professor. I, I, I I'm not quite sure how I would even answer that. Right? This is unprecedented. It, it so is if, unprecedented, indeed. Right. So if you were to go there, I, I I'm not even sure how I would um, move. I would hope the military would uh, intercede and and forces behind out if he lost the election. Right. So we'll see. I, but I have I have no uh, real thoughts. Okay, um, here, here's another question. Let me throw to the panel as well. Um, uh, and it's a clinician asking the question: What can clinicians do to promote greater health equity in 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 the uh, the hospitals and clinics? What what can a, a clinician do? This is Ruben Warren. I think the clinician must understand that most people are not patients and therefore not, don't view his or her activity in the context of their clinical practice, but look at the broader issues, public health issues, and try to synergize what's happening on the outside and translate that into what they're doing on the inside. Okay, thank you. Any, any other suggestions for clinicians who are working on the front line and thinking of what, what are the options available? I think as a clinician, um, there's a lot of prestige that goes along with being a physician or someone in that field. And you have been given this position in society in which you have that power. So using it in a way, not only to advocate for yourself, but thinking about your patients, um, the union power that you have and other ways that you can use that collective um, ability to influence policy in a marketable way. Okay, another question, for Professor Dawes. Um, it, it has to do with um, the, the Native American uh, population. And the questioner says that 95% of the Native American population have died from disease over the last 500 years. Where do they fit into contemporary health initiatives? And why did the timeline of political determinants of health begin when it did? Yeah, well, I, I let me just start with that answer. Um, to answer the latter part. So I started there because that's the period in which we have formal policies um, on the books, right? When it comes to these colonies. And I wanted to look at how it impacted uh, not only indigenous populations, but enslaved people uh, who were brought from Africa to this country. So that's why I started uh, there. Although I agree you're dealing with, um, you know, hundreds of years um, of folks, uh, indigenous communities who have also suffered uh, from these political determinants. And um, it's not an area that I uh, certainly have investigated. I think Margaret Moss at the University of British uh, Columbia would be uh, someone I'd recommend uh, to talk about those issues. But um, I do think it's absolutely important. It is a, there's a reason why I try to uh, bring those pieces, but they, there are issues of, sovereign, of sovereignty that uh, you have to deal with uh, when you're dealing with these groups. I, I do know that uh, in working with uh, tribal nations that uh, they don't often see themselves as part of communities of color because they are distinct nations. So there are political issues and treaties that are separate from these other racial and ethnic um, uh, population groups. All right, An another question for you, Professor Dawes. Um, how can the political determinants of health be addressed within the current lobbying environment? And, and what strategies would you recommend for us to navigate effectively the current lobbying environment? Well, you know, we have gone from spending about $1.35 billion when it comes to lobbying to about $3.51 billion in lobbying uh, since 2010. What we've noticed, if you look at when we were working on the ACA, right? Uh, just even 10 years prior to that, even 15 years prior to the ACA, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce was spending maybe $14 million in lobbying. They ramped up that effort. We've seen lobbying expenditures go through the roof as a result of the ACA. We know that as we move towards spending more on healthcare, so we're spending over $3.5 trillion in this country on healthcare. We've also seen that folks have continued to protect their business interests, right? Those turfs as much as they can. And so the more that we spend on healthcare, you see a similar um, result in terms of lobbying expenditures by these stakeholders in healthcare. So that presents unique challenges for those of us who wanna to continue to push this health equity agenda. How do we again 
when money talks? How do you, again, align this issue with these commercial interests and that government investment value so that you can get uh, your agenda over the finish line? That's something that we have to think about seriously because money does play a role in this. Thank, thank you so very much. Um, and we have time for one last question and I'll allow all of the panelists uh, to weigh in on this question. What can we do? What, what, is it, what strategy would you recommend uh, to effectively address systemic inequities in the US without further categorizing and marginalizing the communities affected? What strategy that, that will address the problems without marginalizing and, 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 and categorizing the, the, the communities? Uh, I, I throw it out to the entire panel. Let, let me start in the context of, of, of ethics and I would argue public health ethics. And if we start specifically with the place and then we evolve to a population in that place. And then once we get to the population, look for the, the uh, policy, if you will, look for the principle, the ethical principle at that place. And that's generalized work across the country if not across the world. Start with the place, then go to the population and go to the principle. That principle is generalizable, particularly around ethics. Thanks. Anyone else? To borrow from critical race theory, I think centering on the margins and making sure that any policy decisions that are made are coming from the people being most affected and the people that were uh, scared of marginalizing and making sure that their voices are included um, and not just included, but listened to and respected. Thank you. Any other comments from any of the other panelists on this question? All right, so let me say a big word of thanks to, to all the panelists, to all the par participants this evening uh, for, for the, the great questions that we've had. Unfortunately, we haven't gotten to all of them, but this has been just, just a, a wonderful conversation, discussion at a timely moment in our history. And at this time, it gives me uh, a pleasure to, to turn the mic back over to Dean Reed. Thank you very much. I wanna thank you um, to all of the speakers tonight and to our moderator, to Ms. Hing, Dr. Figueroa, Dr. Warren, Professor Williams, Professor Dawes. Thank you so much for um, guiding us through this discussion, this thoughtful time. I want to come back to part of what Dr. Warren said about um, spending some time reflecting on what we learned tonight, because this was so filled with information and guidance um, and points of reference um, as we think about our next action and next step. So part of what I would say, although I was not asked, is um, for two things that people can do is everyone listening to this should vote and get others around them to vote. But everyone listening to this should also understand that it doesn't end with just voting. And how do we carry forward with what we've learned so that we continue to act? and move towards equity and move towards justice. Thank you all for your time tonight. Thank you for your contributions. To those who are the participants who listed in, thank you for being here. At the end of this program, there will be some polling questions, two quick questions, two or three quick questions. Please take the time to answer those because we use that information. Again, I thank you and I have to end with a statement. Please vote. Thank you.